Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Reviews. This is a series in which I'm typically reviewing books in practical philosophy in a very broad sense. So everything from philosophy itself and ethics and self-help over to leadership. And what I'm going to be talking about today, this book, How Animals Grieve by Barbara J. King, is a bit of an outlier, you might say. But I think there's a lot of really great lessons in here for thinking about our humanity and our understanding of animals and emotions and our connection to them. It is not that recent of a book. It's 2013 from University of Chicago Press, but I think that a lot of what it says in here is, if not necessarily timeless, certainly timely. And I, I wanted to review this book in part because I was reading it originally for a project that I'm working on, and then I thought, wow, this is, this is really quite good, and it might be something that other people could benefit from, and it does fit in with practical philosophy, again, in a very broad sense, because it has to do with how we understand ourselves and our emotions and those of all the other animals that we run across. So yeah, I think it's, it's well worth checking out. I typically begin these reviews by talking about three big S's, that is style, structure, and summary. And I'm actually going to give a summary part first of the work. So it's, it's a book about, as you could well imagine from the title, animals and how they grieve and whether indeed they do grieve in ways that we humans can identify as such and understand and and relate to and it's focused very much on animal behavior and expression and what that tells us about emotions so there's a lot of material here that is being worked through I'm going to give you more about that when we get into the key ideas. But the overall summary is that many, not necessarily all, but many animals do, in fact, experience grief. And this is reflective of something else that they experience as well, attachment and even love. You can't really grieve without there being a loss and a loss that you actually register. So that, that is sort of the overall summary. I guess you could say that another key part of the summary is that Barbara King is bringing to bear all sorts of tools and approaches to help us understand this and to work her way through this. Now, as far as style goes, I found this book very readable. I think, I think it's actually very well-written, it um, doesn't pander to a popular audience by being folksy when it doesn't have to be so or saying, oh, shucks, we're all in this together or anything like that. It's, it's quite nuanced. It's quite well thought out. And while it's approaching things that are coming from the sciences or from, from other disciplines, it is doing so in a way that I think the ordinary reader can, can get it. And, you know, this is a, a product of Barbara King doing some popular writing and presentation prior to this. So I think that definitely shows in this. It's very well researched. It's very well written. And I think that, you know, regardless of where you're coming at, it should be a pretty clear uh, volume easy to, to make sense out of what she's actually saying, even when she's sort of hedging her bets. Now, as far as the structure goes, I think, you know, as many books, uh, there's the table of contents kind of reveals this. It begins with a prologue on grief and love where she's telling us, here's, here's what I'm, you know, getting at. Here's my methodology. Here's some of my assumptions. Then there's a whole bunch of, we can call them, thematic chapters, and I'll return to those in, in a moment. Um, 
the book ends with an afterword and then acknowledgments and readings and resources and an index, which is quite nice. But after the thematic chapters that are oriented around particular animal species or, or types of, of species, she approaches um, several other really key elements. And so one of these is something that she introduced a little bit earlier, cross-species friendships and love and therefore grief. This is in chapter 10 called No Boundaries. And this is a topic about which we could talk a lot. I mean, we exist now in an internet age in which we can see YouTube videos of cats playing with owls and cuddling up with them and also you know cats attacking crocodiles to ward them off that's a not a friendship but you know the cat is doing that on behalf of the humans perhaps or and and you know all sorts of other kinds of friendships you know a hippo with a rhino and we could go on and on and on um, so that's that's a really important topic. There is a discussion of animal suicide, whether it really is suicide, whether it's intentional or not. Um, there's some discussions about humans as well, uh, beginning in chapter 13, uh, you know, the difference between an animal obituary and a human obituary and whether it's okay to include them in the same newspaper page or website. Uh, there's an entire chapter called Writing Grief, which is examining things from the human perspective. And then, you know, there's some, it ends essentially with a discussion of our pre-human ancestors and whether they really grieved or not. We know they, at a certain point, rituals, burial rituals come into being. And we can think, well, what's, what's actually going on there? And, you know, they are closer to the, the other non-human animals than, than we are, perhaps, in certain respects. So looking at animals might help illuminate our own origins. Now, the chapters that are there, um, there's, you know, it begins with one, Keening for Carson the Cat. So this is going to be about cats. Uh, Dog's Best Friend, which also includes other animals as well um and you know there's there's discussions of horses of rabbits and we could go on and on with with the examples one that i particularly liked was a chapter called bird love which is about corvids in particular the very highly intelligent uh even tool using um quite complex language uh, using uh, birds that, that we encounter. There's discussions of, of elephants, of monkeys. There's a chapter called Sea of Emotion, which brings together dolphins, whales, and turtles. And there's even a, a chapter a little bit later on about bison death. This is where we get to the obituaries, right? And there's discussions of, of uh, not just monkeys, but apes, a lot of different things going on in here. Sheep, pigs, you know, lots of different types of animals being discussed. So that's probably enough about the three S's at this point, I would say. What are some of the key ideas, some of the real takeaways from this work? So uh, one that I think is really important to highlight at the beginning has to do with the kinds of claims that are being made about grief and about, you know, love and associated emotions, not all animals of a particular species are going to necessarily grieve. And even if they do, they won't necessarily all grieve in the same way. So she brings up, you know, a, a great example here. Um, she says, um, just as every smart, not every smart cat is Oscar, not every dog mourns when confronted with death. We shouldn't fall into the trap of making universality a criterion for the existence of a phenomenon, by which I mean we shouldn't require every dog to grieve in order to believe that some dogs do. Almost commonsensical, but a lot of people leave this out because there's, there's a tendency to think of animals as like having a species being and their instincts are revealed in that if they don't all behave that way and we can't explain the weird outliers that it's not really part of their makeup. But, you know, it turns out that animals are much more um, individuated and plastic than we often have given them 
credit for. Um, another really key point I think that is made well in um, the book is that you don't you don't have grief without there being a corresponding positive relation or emotion that of love and joy in the other and care for the other. When we see that animals are grieving, it's because there genu genuinely is a loss. And it's not just, in all cases, a matter of habit. It, it, there's an attachment there that um, can you know, take on some pretty strong manifestations. So I think there's lots and lots of great examples of that in here. And it, it happens in different ways with different species. So, for example, she talks about these great herbivores like the bison and um, elephants in particular um, being interested in the bones of the deceased and relating themselves to that. Whereas, you know, with apes and monkeys, they might carry around the, the corpse of a dead child um, for a long time, right? And then abandon it at a certain point, or it might be taken away from them. Um, sometimes it's not the physical manifestation of the body. Sometimes it's actually where the death took place that the animal will return to and make sense of and, and relate itself to. And sometimes uh, this leads to the animal that is grieving, you know, dying a few months later or a few weeks later. Sometimes there are new processes, you know, an animal, for example, they've got example, you know, cats that are grieving for another cat, a new kitten comes in and the new kitten may be kind of a replacement, but it won't, it won't be related to in exactly the same way as the beloved lost cat. And there's, there may be a little reticence, whereas other animals will throw themselves into relationships uh, with, with other new animals. Another key idea is that um, it's possible to take reductive views, and oftentimes the sciences will, will promote these, of animal behavior and intentionality and emotion, and in this case, grieving, but we, we don't have to be stuck there. There's no reason why we have to say, oh, we have to be totally scientific in a reductive way about this and whatever is happening with Fluffy over there who's lost their their mate, their friend, you know, what, whatever it may happen to be, some other animal, we're just going to assume that they're a meat machine. We don't have to do that. Um, as a matter of fact, that may be, in some respects, anti-scientific. It may block the road to genuine inquiry. So that, that's a good point that she's making. Another key thing that she says at one point is that we have to be careful in equating expression with emotion. It may be quite possible to have an emotion without that emotion being expressed. I mean, we all have interior lives, do we not? And this may be the case for some animals as well. And there's also restrictions on how it is an emotion might be expressed, depending on what kind of animal we're, we're thinking about. You know, she doesn't discuss this in this work, but one of the things we know about cats and dogs is that cats lack the musculature that dogs have that allows their faces to have a different kind of expressiveness, more similar to our own than that of cats. It doesn't mean that a cat does not have the emotion of love, for example. So that's important. Um, I also think it's, it's, it's very interesting that she does attend, and not just in the one single chapter, but in a number of chapters, to the existence of, of cross-species relationships and friendships. And again, I want to stress this point that one of the things we have learned in recent years is just how malleable and open what we assume to be instinctually driven animals turn out to be, how much learning can take place, how much change and adaptability. And, you know, she points out that in some cases, animals may actually seek out another that's not of their kind rather than their own kind for the friendship. And the bond can be quite strong, one that would allow for significant grief.
What are the particularly good points about this work that recommend it to you? I've already pointed out that it's very well written and researched, and so that may be a draw for some people. But one of the things that I found most attractive and actually admirable, uh, admirable about this work is that Barbara King, over and over again, gives us an excellent model for how to speculate well. And what do I mean by this? She is telling us at a number of points, okay, so here's what the science tells us, at least the science as far as we know it at this point, which, you know, it's an incomplete thing. It's not a closed system. Here's the sort of things we observe. Here's some things we might draw from it. I don't want to go so far as to say that these speculations must be true or an adequate picture of things, but there's certainly something to them. And so there's a kind of judiciousness here that I, I really like, a judiciousness about the inferences and conclusions of others and also about one's own as, as the author who's engaging in this. And I think this could, be, this could be a very useful model for a lot of people. Uh, the book is extremely well organized. Um, there's, you know, references in later chapters to what has been discussed in earlier chapters. I think that is, uh, in fact, quite important. She tells you early on what framework she's using. I mean, this could have gone into the summary part, but I think it's, it's kind of good uh, to bring this up. She um, says that... Uh, in the framework that I want to use, uh, the, okay, before that she says, here's the central idea. When an animal feels love for another, she will go out of her way to be near to positively interact with the loved one for reasons that may include but go beyond survival-based purposes such as foraging, predator, defense, mating, and reproduction. In the framework I want to use, this act of choosing by one animal to be with another is a necessary condition, a basic foundation for love. But it is only a necessary condition, not a sufficient one, to claim that we've identified animal love. Another ingredient is needed. Should the animals no longer be able to spend time together, the death of one partner being one possible reason, the animal who loves will suffer in some visible way. She may refuse to eat, lose weight, become ill, act out, grow listless, or exhibit body language that conveys sadness or depression. And so this is, you know, it's great to like clarify at the beginning. Here's what I'm up to. Here's what we're doing in these, these books. Um, I, I think there's a lot of useful distinctions of different types of situations happening in this. So I, that's, that's another plus to this book for me as well. I think another thing that may be a little bittersweet, but on the whole is a positive, is that King addresses how we human beings um, exhibit cruelty towards or indifference towards animals and even exploit them in sometimes horrific ways. You know, she talks about the poaching of um, elephants, for example, and the damage that that does to the community of the elephants and to those who lose their spouses, mates, uh, mothers, you know, um, there's a lot going on there. She, she also talks about um, a few other things as well that I think are, are quite important. Um, one of the most horrific of which is in the uh, one on animal suicide talking about the bear bile farms uh, where brown bears are confined uh, basically their entire life, uh, black bears rather, sorry, um, each bear lies down permanently in a coffin-shaped wire mesh crate for his entire life, years, able to move only one arm so he can reach out for food. Um, without proper anesthetic, drugged only half unconscious, the bear is tied down by ropes and a metal catheter, which eventually rusts, is stuck through the abdomen into his gallbladder. Horrific factory farming taking place, exploitation that, that is, is going on. She writes about dolphin killings. Um, she also writes about, um, here we go, about, um, you know, experiments on various animals, um, 
she says, I experienced an emotional response of my own in reading about these experiments. Um, I wish I had served on the animal care committee that approved these, these tests. There she's talking about um, voles, but you know, there's many others. Think about you know, monkeys that are used in, in labs and all sorts of other similar things. So, so she doesn't shy away from this. She actually gives something like what we would call a trigger warning uh, when it comes to the bear bile farms. Um, and I, I think that not looking away from that sort of stuff and weaving it into the narrative, I think there's, there's an ethical imperative that that answers to. Um, so I think that's a good point of this, this work. Um, that's probably enough about good points. Are there any things about the book that I find problematic? Um, no, not really as such. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's not a completely recent book, so obviously we could say, well, there's probably stuff that could be incorporated into these perspectives that would be, you know, changing the picture slightly or filling it in. I mean, the book could be longer. Any book could be longer and have more examples. These are the sort of nitpicking that, don't really get at the quality of the work, of course. And, and I could go on, of course, as, as a philosopher, I could say, well, I wish you would have engaged philosophy a little bit more um, deliberately and systematically. But it's a good book, even if she doesn't do that. There's, there's so much in here already. Uh, I could say, well, you know, maybe there's too many anecdotes and examples in here, but I actually, I don't think there are. So frankly, I don't have any bad things to say about this book um, other than those not really bad things that I've already brought up. So my final thoughts, if you're asking me for a book recommendation, I unequivocally endorse and recommend this book and say that it's one that you should get and, and read. Um, I myself came to this book because I'm working on a longer term project that has to do with grief in part about how to make end of life decisions about one's own pets, which is an issue that's troubling for many people, causes a lot of anxiety, a lot of remorse, a lot of second guessing. And I thought that reading this book might not answer necessarily questions for me, but at least give me more useful source material. And it has done that. Um, I also think this is a great book just on its own. Um, if you want to engage in some, some real thinking about what it is that the other animals that we share the world with do in terms of love and in terms of grieving, this is going to be, it's not answering every single question, but it's going to be a very useful and interesting, worthwhile book for you to check out.